So we're going to do the integration by substitution, which at first blush seems like a very nebulous topic, very uh, difficult to get your head around. But it's one of those things that gets better with practice. And of course, we're going to give you lots of practice on that in preparation for the final. We're going to look at the method of integration by substitution, both for indefinite integrals and for definite integrals. This is section 5.5 and the last new material of the course. Okay, let me remind you what we've been doing. It's the fundamental theorem of calculus. We spent two sections on this, one section on the second fundamental theorem, the other section on the first fundamental theorem. The first fundamental theorem says that if you take a function and you create its integral function, that is, you integrate from a fixed point A to a variable point X and change X, then the change of this area function is just the value of the function in the integrand. The derivative of the integral is the integrand. The second fundamental theorem says that if you take a function and uh, notice that it's a derivative of another function, then you can evaluate the integral of that function by evaluating the antiderivative on the endpoints and subtracting. Okay, so this was section 5.3, this was section 5.4. Okay, so what we learned from that, especially from the second fundamental theorem, is that anti-differentiation is going to be a key skill in evaluating integrals. And so we should get better at finding antiderivatives of functions. Finding functions whose derivatives are a given function. And what we intimated before is that there are lots of rules for differentiation. And the rules for anti-differentiation are a little bit different kind of animal. They're not as hard and fast. If you're a computer scientist, you can write a program pretty quickly which will differentiate any function. But it's a lot harder to write a program which will find antiderivatives of functions. We do have some rules about anti-differentiation. One is pretty simple, that if you have two functions, the antiderivative of the sum of those two functions can be computed by an antiderivative of each of them added together. Some rule for antiderivatives. Okay, but other rules are kind of particular, like if I so happened to find the integral of 1 over x times the square root of x squared minus 1, then I can just say that's the arc secant. Okay, this is general, this is particular. Um, what we're looking for is something in between. Like, what are we supposed to do with antiderivative rules like that? That doesn't seem to be very useful most of the time. If we had a function such as this one, 2x over the square root of x squared plus 1, or maybe just say plain old tangent of x, how are we supposed to find antiderivatives of functions like that? All right, well, what we'll learn is that we can do this by using an antiversion of one of the rules for differentiation. It's the chain rule. Every rule for differentiation, if you read it backwards, becomes a rule for anti-differentiation. And so this is going to be the anti-version of the chain rule. OK, so I'll do this by example and then uh, give you the basic idea. We're going to look at the find an indefinite integral that is anti-derivative for the function x over the square root of x squared plus 1. So one technique of anti-differentiation uh, is effective sometimes, and that's the guess and check method. Okay? If you are lucky enough to guess, or if the answer strikes you with, as a bolt of lightning, then you'll notice that the integrand is the derivative of the expression square root of 1 plus x squared. Okay? All right, so maybe that not be, may not be very convincing. But once you see that the proposed answer is the square root of 1 plus x squared, then it's not too hard to check because we can take the derivative here, what will we get? This is 1 plus x squared to the 1 half power. So its derivative would be 1 half, 1 plus x squared to the minus 1 half times 2x. The 1 half and the 2 would cancel, so there wouldn't be any constant factors. That x would be in the numerator, and 1 plus x squared to the minus 1 half is like a square root in the denominator. So that does work out. It is true that this is the answer. Um, but I don't know how long it would take for all of us to stare at this question long enough to get the answer. So how can we be a little bit smarter about de uh, deducing that this antiderivative is what it is? Well, the key lies in the fact that this denominator, of the, the thing inside the radical is a complicated function, uh, but the thing in the numerator can be related to the derivative of that thing inside the radical. Okay? The thing inside the radical, which is called the radicand, by the way, is x squared plus 1, and its derivative is a multiple of x. So we can combine this x and this x squared plus 1 in a sort of derivative way. Okay, so what I mean is to say, let's let g of x be x squared plus 1, and g, then g prime of x is 2x. So
So the derivative of the square root of g of x is, using the chain rule, 1 over 2 times g of x to the minus 1 half power times g prime of x. And those things cancel, the 2 and the 1 half, right? the 2 that comes out from g prime of x. And so I get x over the square root of x squared plus 1. So the integral of x over the square root of x squared plus 1 is the integral of the derivative of the square root of g of x. And the integral of the derivative is just that function, the square root of g of x, plus constant. And so the answer I get is the square root of 1 plus x squared plus constant. Okay, So that's a little bit slower. Uh, the trouble I have with this is that the notation is kind of cumbersome. We have to say, let g of x be this thing, and g prime. And so I think really Leibniz notation uh, can make this process a little cleaner. So same problem now, Leibniz notation. Instead of saying x squared plus 1 is a new function g of x, let's just say it's a new variable u, which is related to x. And what I want to find is a relation between integrating functions of u and integrating functions of x. And the relation can be gotten by taking the differential of this equation. Okay. u equals x squared plus 1. That's what we're starting with. And if that's true, then the differential du is equal to 2x dx. Think on that for a bit, because we're going to be coming back to this point over and over, and it's important that we are comfortable with it. du equals 2x dx. That's an equation of the differentials, du and dx. Okay? It's equivalent to saying that the derivative du dx is equal to 2x. All right? When we're taking derivatives, it's useful to use that fractional notation, du dx. But now we're integrating, and so it's a little bit more useful to write it in terms of differentials. So du equals 2x dx is just another way of writing du dx is equal to 2x. What's special now is that this complicated piece of the integrand here, square root of 1 plus x squared, can now be written as the square root of u. That's a little bit simpler. And the whole integral now can be written instead of in terms of x and dx, in terms of u and du. All right, so the numerator is x dx. I know that 2x dx is equal to u, du, so x dx would be equal to 1 half du. And the 1 half is not a big deal as far as the integration scheme goes, because constants can pull outside of the integral. The denominator becomes the square root of u. And so my integrand is now 1 over 2 times the square root of u. And the variable I'm integrating over is not x anymore, it's u. So I transformed the complicated x and dx integral into a much simpler u and du integral. Does everyone see how I did that? Okay. Now what is that integral on the right-hand side? This is really just a power function. It's u to the minus 1 half. In fact, it's 1 half u to the minus 1 half integrated du. And the way to integrate a power function, 99.99% of the time, is to add 1 to the power and divide by that power. Add 1 to the power negative 1 half, you get 1 half divided by 1 half. 1 half divided by 1 half is 1, so the answer I get is u to the 1 half. Okay. When doesn't that work? You know it doesn't work when the power is minus 1, but we also know how to handle that. Okay. So once I've integrated, I have the answer square root of u plus c. But let's put away our toys. u was an, uh, a figment of our construction. We decided that u was going to be x squared plus 1. The question was more about an integral of x. So let's return this into a function of x. But that's easy. We just plug in what u was. u was 1 plus x squared. So the square root of u is the square root of 1 plus x squared. As always, plus constant. OK? Any questions about that process? Uh-huh. How did I get from the 1 half here to the 1 over? OK. Well, when you, when you take um, a fraction and you divide it by another fraction, then you can combine the denominators that way. Think of, you could take this 1 half and move it in front. So it would be 1 half times du over the square root of u. And then that 2 could go into the denominator. OK. There's another way, still another way to do this. And I hesitate to show it to you. But most students seem to like it. So I'll show it to you. And then I'll tell you why I don't like it so much. Uh, anyway, we can do it this way. Let u equal x squared plus 1. Again, du is x dx. Squ uh, square root of 1 plus x squared is still square root of u. And let's take, we want to find out what we can substitute for dx. 
take the equation du equals 2x dx and solve for dx. We can write du dx equals du divided by 2x. All right, so in the integral, I know that this is u, and so the radical is the square root of u. I know that dx is du divided by 2x, and the x I don't do anything with because I know I'll be able to cancel it with this x here. So by subbing in for dx in terms of du and x, I'm able to, again, write the integral completely in terms of u, which is good. Okay, And from there, I can proceed as normal. So I say it was useful but slightly unsavory notation. And that's because, although mathematicians have no qualms about writing equations of differentials like this, du equals 2x dx, to combine the variables on the same side of the equation, that's a little bit hinky, at least as far as I'm concerned. Okay, so du divided by 2x is a little bit strange, whereas du equals 2x dx is not. However, it does get you very quickly to the answer. And maybe it's a little less roundabout than what we did on the last slide, which was try to find something to substitute for x dx altogether. Okay, so either way you want to do it, that's fine with me. Just don't tell the head of my department. Actually, you can tell him. He won't care either. <laughs> OK? So this is the last time I'm going to do this example. Are there any questions about it? OK. Well, then let's do another example. Oh, let's state the actual theorem. OK, the theorem goes like this. If you have a g of x, a differentiable function, and uh, you, you, its range is some interval, and you want to integrate a function over that range, then you can take the complicated composition here f of g of x times g prime of x dx, and substitute instead the integral of f of u du. To say that another way, if you can find an antiderivative for the function small f, then the integral of small f of g of x times g prime of x is capital F of g of x. Okay? And you can see why that is, because what if you were to take the derivative of this thing down here? What's the derivative of capital F of g of x? Well, by the chain rule, it would be capital F prime of g of x times g prime of x. And what's capital F prime? F is an antiderivative for small f, so capital F prime is small f. Does that make sense? OK. Now, like I said, I like to write this in, in Leibniz notation. It's a little bit simpler. Uh, basically, if you have uh, an integrand, which can be written as a function of an uh, interior function times the derivative of that function, then the integral can be written completely in terms of that uh, second function. Okay. So in, in our example, u was 1 plus x squared, and we had a multiple of du dx in the, in the integrand already, so we could slurp them together and write instead an integral of the square root. Okay. And you know, it's nice to remember that, although this doesn't really, isn't really how it works, the du dx and the integral of dx, these are going to cancel away, leaving us with an integral of du. Okay? And this is why we made a big point about that d term on the right-hand side of the integral. Without a differential term, the integral doesn't know what it's integrating. Okay? You can't say integral of x, because you don't know where that integral is being performed. Integral of x dx, now that makes sense. Okay. So now another example. Let's use the substitution u equals x, cubed, x squared plus 3, because we want to find the integral of x squared plus 3 cubed for x dx. OK. Well, this is uh, not, not the hardest problem that could be given to us, because we're told exactly what to substitute. So when I take u equals x squared plus 3, it's pretty clear that this stuff here is going to change into u cubed. Now, what about the 4x? The whole point is to get the integral entirely written in terms of u's and du's. So what does the 4x dx become? Well, what's du? du is 2x dx again. Okay, And so 4x dx can be written as 2 times du. Do you see that? du equals 2x dx, so double it. 2 du is 4x dx. And 4x dx is exactly the leftover stuff that I have in my integrand. OK, so x squared plus 3 cubed times 4x dx is going to be u cubed times 2 du. Okay. 
So I'm, just, I'm equally happy to have uh, 4x dx as 2x dx or 6x dx. Really, any multiple of x dx is going to be OK, because I can scale by a constant and then pull that constant out of the integral. That constant is not going to make this integral uh, harder at all. All right, so my integral becomes, instead of this polynomial, this polynomial, u cubed du. OK, but that's a nice power function. Couldn't be easier, right? It's uh, 1 half u to the fourth. Because you raise the power by 1, divide by the power, 2 divided by 4 is 1 half. Okay? And then, once again, put away your choice. We have to write this back in terms of the original um, variable. We should give back a function of x. Okay. Is there another way to do this integral? Say you don't like substitution. You want to avoid substitution. Can you do it another way? Okay, some of you are nodding sagely. What's another way to do this? All those sage nodders have suddenly gone quiet. What's another way to do this integral? Yeah, right, it's a polynomial. So you could just multiply it all out. And a polynomial is a sum of multiples of power functions. And we know how to do that. So we can do it just by multiplying out the whole thing. X, cube, x squared plus 3 cubed, if you expanded it, would be x to the 6 plus 9x to the 4th plus 27x squared plus 27. Uh, and all that is multiplied by 4x dx. So we can distribute the 4x. 4x to the 7th plus 36x to the 5th plus 108x cubed plus 108x. And now we just integrate that term by term. So the integral of 4x to the 7th is 4x to the 8th divided by 8. That's 1 half x to the 8th. The integral of 36x to the 5th is 36x to the 6th divided by 6. Hence, 6x to the 6th. The integral of 108x cubed is 108x to the 4th divided by 4, 27x to the 4th. And the integral of 108x is 108x squared over 2. That would be 54x squared. All right. So which one would you rather do? Would you rather do the substitution method or the expand and integrate term by term method? How many would rather do substitution? OK, how many would rather multiply out? OK, we've got one taker who likes algebra, which is fine. I mean, like I said, you, uh, it's hard to program a computer to do antiderivatives. And early versions of Mathematica, that's the uh, program behind Wolfram Alpha, used to always multiply out polynomials. Even when there was a very simple substitution that would make the integral very doable, it would just say, multiply it all out. Right? 100 term polynomial, no problem for Mathematica. Uh, but there's definitely a simpler way to do it. If your power is low, like 3 or you know 2, it's probably the same amount of work to do the substitution versus multiply it out. Okay? But once that power gets very large, would you like to multiply out x squared plus 3 to the 100 power? No. No one would want to do that. It would have 101 terms to it. Okay? And then you have to integrate all of those. But substitution, whether this power is 3 or 12 or 101 or whatever, it's the same amount of work no matter what. So the higher that power gets, the more substitution uh, saves you time. OK, the other thing we ought to check is that these do actually get the same answer. OK, because if we did it with substitution, the answer we got was 1 half x squared plus 3 to the fourth power. And if you expand that out, this is what you get. 1 eighth x to the eighth plus 6x to the sixth plus 27x to the fourth plus 54x squared. All of this we also got by uh, doing the polynomial method, multiplying it out. But well, we have this extra 81 halves. Okay? So what, why is there a discrepancy between the answer we get by substitution and the answer we get by uh, expansion? Is one of them wrong? Why do we have different answers here? I'm, I'm dragging you guys across the finish line, whether you like it or not. We're gonna we're going to finish this class interactively. Why is the, uh, what, what's the reason behind the discrepancy here? OK, this is brute force, right? This is, this is what, the one you wanted to see? One answer we got one half x squared plus three to the fourth power. One answer we got 
uh, uh, same thing without the 81 halves. Yeah? Okay, it is because of the C. Remember that an integral is just one choice of antiderivative, and all other choices of antiderivatives are different by a constant. So when we say integral of x cubed plus 3 cubed 4x dx equals this, it's equal to this plus a constant. And it's also equal to this plus a constant. Okay, So these constants uh, will be different in either case. But it's still true that this function plus constant equals this function plus constant. Or put it maybe a way that's less confusing. You can have two answers for the same integral as long as they're different by a constant. And that's, in fact, the exact difference between these two functions, the constant 81 halves. So where, where did the constant go? Well, when you multiply this out, um, exactly. And even, even if this x weren't there, and the integrand multiplied out ended in a constant, you would integrate that constant, it would end in x. Okay. So any anytime you integrate a polynomial term by term, you won't get a constant term at the end. But there should there should be one there that you would have to determine later. Okay. So these answers are the same when you add the constant. Okay. How about integral of tangent? I advertise that as one that we should that you know morally speaking we should know how to find an integral of tangent. Um, when we're thinking about substitution, though, the idea is to look for a piece of the integrand that can be a function uh, that appears along with its derivative. Okay? So for this example, you know, we said, OK, x squared plus 3 is a, is a piece of the integrand, and its derivative is 2x dx. I can write the rest of it in terms of that. And if I stare at tangent, I really only see the tangent part. It's unclear what would be the rest of it. How would I substitute? for tangent, since I can't figure out a du. But if you write tangent as sine x over cosine x, maybe there is another way that uh, you can group things to make this more evident. You have any ideas on that one? If you write tangent as sine x over cosine x, what would be a good choice for u in this case? Cosine. OK, let me get to the right page. Why cosine? Well, if u is cosine, the derivative of cosine is negative sine, and the numerator is a multiple of negative sine. It's the opposite of negative sine. So that does work out. If I let u be cosine x, what is du? du is negative sine x dx. OK, so tangent x would be uh, sine x over cosine x dx, u, and then the rest of the integrand is negative du. Okay. du is negative sine x dx. This is u. Sine x dx is negative 1 times du. Okay? I put them in somewhat strange places. But remember, the negative is a constant. I can just pull it out to the front. I can not worry about that negative until the very end. And whether I write 1 over u or du over u, those are, those are the same. 1 over u du would be equal to du over u. Okay? And so now I just have to integrate 1 over u du. That's another power function, right? That's u to the minus 1. But it's the one power function that we can't integrate using the power rule. What's the antiderivative of 1 over u? Natural log of u. OK, so the answer we're going to have is the negative of the natural log of the absolute value of u. Okay, why the absolute value bars? Remember that natural log of the absolute value is a function whose domain is all non-zero numbers. And so that's the larger function. That's the better antiderivative. OK, so let's write this back in terms of our original variable x. So you could write it as negative of the natural log of the absolute value of cosine x plus constant. Or if you want to get rid of that minus sign, you can also write it as the natural log of the absolute value of secant x plus c. Now, how do I get from here to here? How do I get from negative natural log of absolute value of cosine x positive natural log of the absolute value secant x. Hmm? Very good. Yes, we're, pull, we're doing the opposite of pulling the exponent out of the logarithm. This is like a negative 1 multiple. 
So you can pull it inside the logarithm where it becomes a negative 1 power. Logarithms change powers to multiples. Okay, so what's cosine x to the minus 1 power? That's the reciprocal of cosine, which is secant. All right, so you can write it as a natural log of the absolute value secant x plus constant. Are you required to do that? No. I kind of like it that way because now I'm reminded that this is a positive function. Secant x is always at least 1. So the natural log of the secant of x is always at least 0. And that's satisfying because I remember that tangent's always increasing. So its derivative is always positive. This doesn't necessarily look like a positive number, does it? But remember, if cosine is less than 1, which it usually is, the log of it's negative. All right, so it's less confusing to me to write it that way. Questions? Mm -hmm. How do I get from this step to this step? OK. So the thing is, I want to find a piece of the integrand that appears along with its derivative. Okay. And if I say, let's let that piece be cosine, that works because the rest of the integral is, is written in terms of sine. Okay. So I want this to be u. That's my decision now. This will be u. If that's true, if u is cosine x, then du is minus sine x dx. This is just another way of saying du dx is negative sine x. All right? I want to take this integral and take it from an x and dx integral into a u and du integral. I've already decided that cosine x is going to become u. And sine x dx is negative du. Does that make sense? If du is negative sine x dx, then I can put the negative on the other side and say sine x dx is negative du. Okay? So negative du is the same as writing the negative sign out front and putting 1 in the numerator times du. Okay? All right. Other questions about that one? Now, how did I decide to make u be cosine and let du be sine x? Yeah? Exactly, right? Because that, that's, that's what works. Uh, another possibility, another choice is to let u be sine, and then du is a multiple of cosine, and that appears down here. But this is not as easy. When we substitute, we want to see the derivative of the thing we're substituting for, but we need to see it in the numerator, because that's where the du happens. It has to be in the numerator. We don't have an integral with du in the denominator. Don't know how to do that, OK? So if you want to try it the other way, it does actually work, but it starts to get pretty complicated. So I'll show you this not because uh, you know, I think it's a viable alternative, but just to show you how bad it could be. Do you have a question? Well, there's a negative here. The integral of 1 over uh, u is natural log. So this negative is the same as this negative. Uh, are you okay with a negative being here? Exactly. Yeah, that's where it's coming from, from the derivative of cosine. So this negative comes from the fact that the derivative of cosine is negative sine, and so I need to balance that out. There's no negative sign here. If there were, I would just bring it into du, but since there isn't, I have to have a minus sign. OK, so this minus sign tells me I need a minus sign here, and then it gets carried down. Right, right, because we're trying to undo the chain rule. So we're going to use the chain rule to figure out what adjustments we have to make. OK, and the derivative of sine, the cosine is negative sine, so we have to adjust the integrand a little bit to make sure we have the exact same thing. OK, let's do, I'm going to show you how it works if you try to do it the other way around. If you try to let u be sine x, then du would be cosine x dx. And the trouble is that if I want to make the substitution, OK, sine x, that's going to be u. dx, that's going to be du over cosine x. And my cosines, instead of canceling, combine. And I have a cosine x and another cosine x. 
All right, so I, I come up with an integral that looks like uh, u du divided by cosine squared x. And I can't do the integral if it has x's and u's at the same time. Okay? When you get, if you get stuck with an integral that's got two variables in it, like x and u at the same time, then maybe this isn't the best substitution. You might want to back out and try another one. Okay? Now, you could also, though, in this case we can use a trig identity. Cosine squared x is 1 minus sine squared of x. And so sine squared x is u. This is 1 over u squared. Now we do have an integral completely in terms of u and du. Okay? And you could do this because the denominator is 1 minus u squared. So think about the derivative of the denominator. It would be negative 2u du. And the numerator has that critical u du stuff. We can scale that by minus 2 to get it all to work. And if you do that, this is what you would get. Uh, you would let y be 1 minus u squared. So du is minus 2u du. 1 minus u squared is y. u du can be written as u times dy over negative 2u. Here I did the thing I told you that I didn't like it if you did, but you can do it. D, du is dy divided by negative 2u. U's cancel, and I get negative 1 half dy over y. And that becomes negative 1 half times the natural log of the absolute value of y. And from there on, we just do the unsubstitution. What's y? It's the square root of 1 minus u squared. Uh, y is 1 minus u squared. Negative 1 half times the log is the same as that thing to the negative 1 half power, which is like writing it in the square root with a denominator. Okay. What's u? u is sine x, so I have 1 minus sine squared x. That uh, 1 minus sine squared is cosine squared. The square root of 1 minus cosine of cosine squared would be the absolute value of cosine, and that is what I got before. Okay? So we can get there. All substitutions, if they work, will lead to the right answer. But the trouble is making sure that it, that it works or that you can make it work. All right, so don't be afraid to try different substitutions. Some might, maybe it's not your first guess which will work. Okay, questions about that, that last method? Doing the sine and the cosine thing. Key idea, we want to grab a part of the integrand uh, which, so that you can write the integrand in terms of a function of that and the derivative of that. Okay, so how do things change when you have definite integrals? Well, when definite integrals, you have numbers up and down on the uh, integral sign. So the substitution rule for definite integrals is going to have numbers in it, or limits to the integration. Same hypotheses as before. The definite integral from a to b of f of g of x times g prime of x dx is the integral of f of u to u from g of a to g of b. So why do the limits change? Well, the thing on the left, that's an integral of x. And if you like, you can think of that as living in some space where the variable is called x. And the integral on the right, that's an integral of u, and that's in a completely different space. That's the u space. Okay? Uh, so we, need to, we have an equation between an integral in u land and an integral in x land. And so the limits in the integral on, in x land, those are values of x. Likewise, with the integral in u's, these are values of u. I convert x's to u's, so I have to convert these x's to u's as well. And how do I convert x's into u's? Well, the substitution is u equals g of x. All right, so if you have a definite integral and you're making a substitution, the limits of integration can change at the same time as the integral. All right, so let's see this one in action. Let's do the integral of cosine squared x times sine x from 0 to pi. Okay? Having just showed you the uh, substitution rule for definite integrals, I'm going to ignore it. I'm going to see if I can do this integral without it. I'll call that the slow way, not to bias you or anything, but this is how you would do it. Let's just do the integral of cosine squared x times sine x dx, and then once we get that indefinite integral, we'll plug in our two values of x. Okay. What would be a good choice of u here for this integral? Cosine squared x times sine x dx. Yes, sir. Cosine x. And why did you pick cosine? Okay, because the derivative of cosine is negative sine. Cosine squared can be written as a function of cosine, and everything else is the derivative of cosine. So if u is cosine, du is minus sine x dx, and my integral becomes the integral of u squared du 
times a negative. Because this is u squared, and sine x dx is negative du. OK? So I can do that integral pretty easily. The integral of u squared du is negative. The integral of negative u squared du is negative 1 third u cubed plus constant. And so my answer is negative 1 third times cosine cubed x plus constant. Now, if I want to evaluate that uh, integral between two endpoints, I take the antiderivative, which I just figured out, and plug in the two endpoints. What is the cosine of pi? It's negative 1. Negative 1 cubed is negative 1. So I have negative 1 third times negative 1. Uh, what's the cosine of 0? It's 1. 1 cubed is 1. Negative 1 third times 1 is negative 1 third. And then I want to subtract it. So I have negative 1 third times negative 1 cubed minus 1 cubed. And that is 2 thirds. Lots of negatives, right? There's a negative multiple of the whole thing. And the negative uh, cosine, of pi, cosine of pi is negative 1. You cube that, we get another negative 1. Okay? But we do, in fact, get a positive 2 thirds for my answer here. That wasn't so bad. But let me see how I would get the same answer using substitution in the definite sense. So same substitution I made before. u is cosine x, du is minus sine x. This time I'm going to substitute the limits of integration. What is u of 0? That is the cosine of 0. And what did we say the cosine of 0 was? 1. Okay. So unless your phone has a unit circle on it, we don't need to be looking at our phones right now. u of 0 is 1. u of pi is negative 1. Okay. So my integrand becomes the integral from 1 to negative 1 of negative u squared du. Now, this is kind of weird because our integral goes from a higher number to a lower number. And that's backwards, right? So let me flip those in the right direction. To do so, to flip the limits of integration, costs a minus sign. That's no problem. I have a minus sign to spare. So I can write the negative of the integral from 1 to negative 1 as the integral from negative 1 to 1 of u squared du. And now I can just do power rule on that. It's 1 third u cubed. Plug in 1, I get 1 third. Plug in negative 1, I get negative 1 third. 1 third minus negative 1 third is 2 thirds. OK. So which do you like better? The first way, where you just do the indefinite integral and plug in? Or do you like the second way, where you do the substitution and the limits at the same time? How many like the first one? OK. How many like the second one? OK, great. Well, more you like the second one. But you know the first one always works. You can always just, if you get confused, do first the integration and then plug in. But what I like about the second way is that once we get to this stage, we don't have to think about the fact that u was cosine x anymore. We can just do an integral of u. And the u integral is going to be simpler anyway. We do the same amount of math in both cases. In both cases, we do have to plug in cosine of 0 and cosine of pi. We don't save any, any actual uh, or arithmetic or anything. But keeping it organized this way saves me the trouble of substituting and then unsubstituting. I can substitute and then keep it all in terms of u. My answer is going to be the same. All right, that's my pitch for doing it this way. But there's no accounting for taste. You can do it any way you like. Okay, next example. Let's do the integral of e to the 2x times e to the 2x plus 1 uh, from natural log of the square root of 3 to natural log of the square root of 8. Okay. Now, most of the time, examples are not cooked up to be arithmetically cumbersome. So the fact that the limits of integration are awful as we see them, natural log of the square root of 3 and natural log of the square root of 8, uh, what happens usually in situations like this is that it will simplify when you do the substitution. Okay. What substitution are we going to do? Well, one substitution would be to let u be e to the 2x. Why would I do that? Well, then e to the 2x is also a multiple of the derivative of e to the 2x. So I can let u be e to the 2x, and then write the e to the 2x dx as a multiple of du. So if I do that, then e to the 2x plus 1 becomes u plus 1. And e to the 2x times dx becomes 1 half du. Okay, I'm, I'm substituting it in different places, but from here, make sure you understand why I've done that. 
du is 2e to the 2x dx. All of this stuff is the square root of u plus 1. This e to the 2x and this dx is a half of du. So I have 1 half times the integral of the square root of u plus 1. Right? Now what about the 3 and the 8? Where does that come from? Well, if you want to take e to the 2 times natural log of the square root of 3, remember that multiplying a logarithm is the same as raising that uh, thing inside the logarithm to that power. So 2 times the natural log of the square root of 3 is the natural log of the square root of 3 squared, but the square root of 3 squared is 3, and e to the natural log of 3 is 3. And so this is why e to the 2 times the natural log of the square root of 3 just becomes 3. And same thing for the 8. We get that those complicated limits turn into these nice limits. OK, so we got to here. Can we do this integral? Well, this is still kind of complicated. To make it utterly simple, I could do another substitution. Let y equals u plus 1. So the integral of 1 half from uh, integral 1 half, sorry, 1 half times the integral from 3 to 8 of the square root of u plus 1 becomes square root of y dy integrated between 4 and 9 times a half. Are you with me on that? y was u plus 1, so the square root of u plus 1 becomes the square root of y. What's the derivative dy du? That would just be 1. So dy and du are interchangeable. I can change this dy, I can change this du to a dy. Limits of integration, they have to change. How do I get from u's to y's? According to my substitution, y is u plus 1. So these y's, sorry, these u's, when they become y's, just add 1. OK, and now finally I've got an integral I can do just using the power rule. This is y to the 1 half. Its antiderivative would be uh, y to the 3 halves divided by 3 halves, which is the same as multiplying by 2 thirds. And then I'm going to plug in my two limits of integration, y equals 9 and y equals 4. When I do that, I get 1 third times 27 minus 8, in other words, 19 thirds. Okay. Questions about that? Hmm. So how is it that uh, I get the 27 and the 8 here? Where do those come from? Uh, second fundamental theorem. The second fundamental theorem allows me to change this integral into this thing. But I'm asking a more arithmetic question. Why, where does the 27 come from? That's a frequently asked question, so I'll ask you guys that. Why 27? Why 27? Go ahead. Cube 9, take the square root. Right. The 3 halves power means cube it and take the square root. Or it means take the square root and cube it. So if you take the square root of 9, you get 3. Cube it, you get 27. And so hence 27. 2 to the 3 halves, or 4 to the 3 halves, is take the square root and then cube it. So it would be 2 cubed, hence 8. Now you could also do uh, 4 cubed square rooted. That would be 64 square rooted. That's 8 either way. But sometimes when the numbers get big, it's easier to take the square root and then cube. All right, so make sure you're familiar with these fractional exponents, which I've got right here. 9 to the 3 halves is 9 to the 1 half to the 3 power. That is 3 cubed, or 27. 4 to the 3 halves, same process, gets you 8. OK, so the integral becomes 1 third times 27 minus 8, 19 thirds. Much better than it would look, right? OK. Now, is that the only substitution? No, there's lots of other substitutions. This is the first one that we did. Can you think of another thing that we could make u equal to? e to the 2x plus 1. OK, let's do it that way instead. e to the 2x plus 1, because basically this is going to save us one substitution. Because what's the derivative of e to the 2x plus 1? It's the same as the derivative of e to the 2x. 
So when we substituted e to the 2x, we got the, we, you know, we're able to complete the substitution. We should also be able to complete it again. du is still going to be 2 times e to the 2x dx. And so the e to the 2x and the dx here are the e to the 2x and the dx here. So I can change the rest of the integrand to 1 half du. The difference now is that instead of the square root of u plus 1, we absorb the plus 1 into u. So I now just have the square root of u. The other difference is that when I change the limits of integration, I'm adding 1 at the same time. So I get the 4 to 9. Okay. So I've actually I've, I've done both substitutions at once. And I've gotten in one step to the place where I can just use the power rule and get the same answer that I got before. Okay. So moral of the story is that you can get different kinds of substitutions to the same answer. And some of them might get you there quicker. There's no style points. right? You don't get bonus points for getting it in one substitution when you uh, could have done it in two. But it's useful to know that, you can, that there are flexibilities that you can take advantage of. Is there anything else we can do? Any other possible substitution? Hmm. This is probably the most obvious one. But there's also some non-obvious ones. I'm going to try it this way. I'll let you be the entire square root business here. Okay, And if I do that, then I can write the equation u equals the square root of e to the 2x plus 1 another way as u squared equals e to the 2x plus 1. And I can take that equation of the two variables, u and e to the 2x plus 1. It's not explicit anymore. It's implicit. But I can still take its implicit differential. So the differential of u squared is 2u du. And the differential of e to the 2x plus 1 is 2 times e to the 2x dx. So that means I can still, now I can substitute for e to the 2x dx, I can substitute u du. All right, so my integral becomes the integral from 2 to 3. All of this stuff is u. And then the leftover stuff is u du. All right, so now the, in, the integrand is as simple as could be. It's just u squared du. And the limits of integration now, they have to include that square root business. So instead of 4 to 9, I've got the square root of 4 and the square root of 9. Um, integration is easy. It's 1 third u cubed. Plug in 3. Plug in 2. 3 cubed is 27. 2 cubed is, is 8. And again, I get 19 thirds. All right. That was, I guess, if there were style points, that would get very high style points because you got it very quickly down to a very simple integral. But not necessary. Just want to show you that there are multiple ways to do it. Okay. Other questions about this? Okay. Well, here's one for you to try. Let's do the integral of uh, cotangent to the fifth of theta over six times secant squared of theta over six from pi to three pi over two. Oh my god. No, no, it's not that bad. Uh, think about before you dive in, is there a way that you could quickly simplify this? Maybe not to something that's much simpler, but something that's just a little bit simpler. Okay, and then think about what kind of a u choice you might make so that the rest of the integrand can be written in terms of u and du. Okay. So think about a quick substitution if you can find one. And also think about how to combine the cotangent and the secant in a u and du pair. Okay. So let's take a few minutes to uh, sweat that out. So the first part is so what easy substitutions might help. Most people don't, don't see that. But I want to make sure that you think about simple substitutions like this. You see the theta over 6 and the theta over 6. If it were me, I would not want to see theta over 6. I would much rather have something without a denominator. So let me make a quick substitution uh, for theta over 6, because then I can, make, I can worry about the trig later. So that would be my instinct. Uh, I need another name for a variable. I like to pair Greek variables. So the next one after theta would be phi. phi let's phi be theta over 6. d phi is d theta over 6. And so my integral becomes cotangent cubed of phi, secant cubed of phi, and then d theta is 6 d phi. My limits of integration have to change as well. To get from thetas to phi's, I divide by 6. So pi goes to pi over 6. 3 pi over 2 goes to 3 pi over 12, which is pi over 4. So my integral is now the 6 
times the definite integral from pi over 6 to pi over 4 of secant squared phi d phi. And rather than writing this cotangent to the fifth, I'll write it as 1 over tangent to the fifth. That is a huge hint, right? Because what's the derivative of tangent? Secant squared. All right? When you see an integral and you've got secant squared, useful rule of thumb is that, oh, wait, this is the derivative of tangent. Can I use a tangent substitution? And the answer is yes, because the rest of the integral is 1 over tangent to the fifth. OK, so I'll do that next. I'll let u be tangent phi. du is secant squared phi d phi. And that's exactly what the numerator is, secant squared phi d phi. So my integral uh, becomes 1 over u to the fifth, right? u to the minus 5. The tangent of pi over 6 is 1 over the square root of 3. The tangent of pi over 4 is 1. And so the integral of u to the minus fifth is u to the minus 4 divided by negative 4. Evaluated between 1 and the square root of 3. Do all the algebra, and you end up with the number 12. Bet you didn't think that answer was going to be 12, did you? <laughs> OK. Now this is very good. Uh, and two things, su easy substitutions, if you can do it. Also, thinking about, think flexibly about derivatives. Okay. Here are some pictures. The fact that this integral has theta over 6 and you make the substitution, you're basically scaling things horizontally by a factor of 1 sixth. To preserve the area, you have to scale things vertically by a factor of 6. So this in er bit of area gets squished. I still got two minutes by this clock. This is what I'm going by. This area gets squished, but to keep it being the same area, we have to stretch it in the other direction. Okay, And that's exactly what substitution is doing there. And then when we do the second substitution, uh, u equals tangent phi, obvious, but the integral, the area of this region is the same as the area of this re region. Okay, so let me give you a little bit of advice about making these u and du choices. You want to look for, basically you want a pair of things in the integrand. You want to see a function and its derivative. Maybe not exactly its derivative, but a multiple of its derivative. So look for, say, like an x to the n and an x to the n minus 1. If you've got x cubed, look for x squared. If you've got x squared, look for x to the 1. If you've got 1 over x, see if you can pair it with a natural log, then u would be natural log, du would be 1 over x dx. Uh, that would be, anytime you have x in the denominator, you can think about it as 1 over x. Sine and cosine, cosine and sine, you know those who go together. Uh, tangent and secant squared, so secant squared is the flag to try tangent. Uh, also, square root of x and square root of x in the denominator these are function derivative pairs, too. And, you know, e to the x pairs with itself. Okay, so those are some examples of things to try when doing all these substitutions. 